It was a beautifully warm, sunny, and gorgeous afternoon in downtown Honolulu. Thousands of residents walked and drove the streets, heading off to work or school or out for an adventure on the beach. Somewhere, mixed into the hustle and bustle of city life, a little girl wandered back and forth between two convenience stores. 12-year-old Ji Zhao Li was excited. Her school was conducting a fundraiser selling tickets for a chilly dinner for a trip to the Big Island. Ji was hopeful about the event and wanted to earn herself a seat on the flight, begging her mother to allow her to go out and sell some tickets. After a lot of begging and maybe a little whining, Ji Zhao got her way as long as she promised to be back by 5 p.m. Beaming her irresistible smile, Ji Zhao bounced out of the family home, but she never made it back. Initially, investigators assumed they were working on a case of a runaway or a lost child. However, it quickly became clear that something more sinister may have been involved. Multiple witnesses reported seeing Ji Zhao talking to an older man in the moments before she vanished, while others claimed to have seen her being held hostage by an unknown man days later. Soon, the outlook turned grim, with detectives assuming the child had likely been killed. What happened to Ji Zhao Li? Had she been abducted at random by someone she attempted to sell a raffle ticket to? Or had someone specifically targeted the child with plans of taking her far away from the island of Oahu? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 199, The Disappearance of Ji Zhao Li. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we'll examine the mysterious disappearance of 12-year-old Ji Zhao Li. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. As a final note before jumping into the episode, I just want to apologize in advance for my pronunciation of certain words in this episode. I did get assistance in pronouncing them, but I guarantee you I'm going to mess some of them up. 12-year-old Ji Zhao Li was excited to participate in her school's fundraiser. Learning about a trip to the Big Island, she was determined to sell enough tickets to get herself a seat on the plane. Sadly, one February afternoon in 1988, she left her home to sell tickets and never made it back. This is episode 199, The Disappearance of Ji Zhao Li. The capital city of Honolulu is seated along the southern shore of Oahu, the third largest of the Hawaiian Islands. With a population of more than 350,000 residents spread across less than 70 square miles, it's a bustling city which, aside from its beautiful location described so often as paradise, is also known as the gateway to the world for the Hawaiian Islands, being the central hub for business, finance, hospitality, and military defense. Known for its diversity, not just in its population but also cuisine and tradition, Honolulu is made up of a mix of Asian, Western, and Pacific cultures. There is a unique dichotomy defined by the contrast of beautiful ocean views, far green fields, and picturesque cliffs blended with the ashen scars of dusty gray highways, abandoned buildings, and congested city streets. On any given day, thousands upon thousands of residents hit the streets, in their cars, on their bikes, and walking the sidewalks as they go about their days, heading to school, to work, to their houses, or out for a little fun in the sun. There's a steady flow of motion as waves of people flood the city throughout the day before the tide pulls back and the streetlights click on to illuminate the approach of evening. 
While for many, the slow flicker and buzz of lights along the roadside signaled the end of another busy day, on a warm winter evening in February of 1988, these lights transformed the concern of one small family into panic and worry. Li Yan and her husband Di Chang looked out the small windows of their tiny apartment, hoping for the return of their 12-year-old daughter, Ji Zhao. Hours earlier, the eager child had begged her mother to allow her to go out for just an hour to try and sell some raffle tickets handed out by her school for an annual field trip. She'd promised to return home before dinner, but the table had been set hours earlier, and there was no sign of Ji Zhao. Together, Ji's parents left their Kailu Street home and made the short walk towards Nu'uanu Avenue, the main thoroughbred stretching through their little corner of Honolulu. It was along this stretch of road that Ji had planned to try and sell her tickets, apparently moving back and forth between two 7-Eleven convenience stores located at major intersections just three-tenths of a mile apart. For an hour or two, the couple walked back and forth looking for any signs of their daughter or anyone who may have seen her earlier that evening. Being immigrants from China who didn't yet speak English, trying to track down the missing 12-year-old was only made more complicated by the language barrier. It was a fruitless effort, and after realizing that the situation required more than their own means, the Lee family returned home and contacted the Honolulu police to report their daughter missing. Within an hour of the initial report, detectives from the missing persons unit, the juvenile division, and officers from the patrol unit hit the streets in search of Ji Zhao. At the time, they imagined they'd find the 12-year-old quick. Perhaps she'd met up with friends and lost track of time, or maybe she'd gotten lost and was attempting to find her way back in the dark. No one involved in the case, nor in Ji Zhao's own family, could ever have imagined that more than 30 years later, the mystery of Ji Zhao's disappearance would endure as one of the oldest and most frustratingly painful missing persons cases in the history of Hawaii. Ji Zhao Li was born on Thursday, April 10th, 1975, to parents Li Yan and Di Chang in Canton, China, today known as Guangzhou. Ji was the Li's second born child and second daughter. While her birth was expected and joyously celebrated by her family, it was, at the time, against China's policies regarding childbirth. When Ji was born, families were expected to keep a gap of four years between births, and in the vast majority of instances, were a woman to become pregnant during this gap, she would be encouraged to have an abortion. Ji was born just two years after her older sister, which resulted in her family having to go above and beyond to keep her existence hidden from local authorities. Li Yan had had a difficult upbringing, losing both of her parents by the time she was nine years old. Orphaned and with nowhere to run, she survived by wandering from town to town seeking work. In an interview conducted with the Honolulu Star Bulletin, Leon explained that, as a teen, she often took jobs babysitting in exchange for little more than a bowl of watery rice gruel. In her later teen years, Leon picked up work on a farm, and it was then that her life began to develop some level of security and stability. She'd go on to meet, fall in love with, and marry Di Chang, and together they'd have their first daughter. Ji Zhao has been described by her family as a devoted, helpful, kind, and loving child who went out of her way to help others and never needed to be asked to complete a task, taking it upon herself to help her family as much as she could. Li Yan once recalled to a reporter how during difficult times they had very little food. Since they couldn't acknowledge Ji's birth, they couldn't receive an increase to their food and milk rations, making things even more difficult. One night... There wasn't enough food to go around, and Li Yan sat down to an empty plate. Suddenly, Ji appeared and placed an egg on her mother's plate, explaining that she'd saved it for her mom so she'd have something to eat, too. For years, Li Yan had dreamed of escaping China, which she described as living entirely without freedom. She hoped to get her family to a new country, a place where they would have a chance to forge their own futures without the oppressing rules and regulations set by the government. In the mid-1980s, that dream came true when relatives living in Hawaii contacted Li Yan with the exciting news. They had finally been approved for visas and were free to come to Hawaii and start their lives anew. 
The Lee family were thrilled to discover they'd found a way out, though it wouldn't be an easy trip, nor would they find starting from the ground up all that welcoming or comforting either. But as Lee Yan's interpreter explained to reporters, quote, she really wanted to come to this country, and she wants to stay here and become a citizen. She says there is no freedom in China. Here, at least, she is free. End quote. In 1985, the family picked up stakes and left China behind, heading towards the Hawaiian Islands, where they would settle on Oahu. By this time, their unit had grown by one more, with Li Yan and Di Chang being the parents of three daughters, giving Ji Zhao both an older and younger sister. Ten years old at the time, Ji Zhao was excited about the move to a new country where she'd no longer have to be hidden away and concealed. Things didn't go quite the way the Li family had imagined, though. Arriving in Hawaii, they managed to find a place to live, but it wasn't much. They moved into a garage, which had been converted into a living unit. There was running water, but no hot water, requiring the family to heat their own water for baths. The bathroom itself was remarkably small, with the tub jutting out from the wall, requiring them to walk around it as they entered the room. The floor was stained with paint and oil, much of which was hidden beneath a patchwork of carpet scraps which simulated a living area for the family. There were holes in the walls patched over and stuffed with folded over sheets of aluminum foil. Living conditions were tough, but in exchange for an escape from China, it was, to the Lee family, a price worth paying. Ji Zhao was enrolled at the Royal Elementary School along with her younger sister. Her older sister was just beginning high school. Ji was placed in what are known as SLEP classes, with SLEP, S-L-E-P, meaning speakers with limited English proficiency. She would attend classes in two phases, one from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. and another from 12.30 to 2.15 p.m. While Ji was learning to speak English, there was slow but steady progress, resulting in her speaking in somewhat broken English though her teacher stated they could understand her easily, and while Ji couldn't speak English fluently, she understood the language far more than she could adequately communicate. Sherry Kim, one of Ji's SLEP instructors, described her as a kind and generous child, telling the Star Bulletin, quote, She was very giving. She used to bring a lot of candy to school. She was always sharing her candy with other kids. End quote. Other teachers described her as shy, but somewhat outgoing. She made friends, she laughed, she played with others well, and she didn't seem to encounter too many issues adapting to the vastly different society she now found herself in. Mary Chun, a part-time teacher at the school, got to know Ji very well from working closely with her. She got to know Ji as an independent young woman who stood up for others and didn't let other kids mess with her. She explained, quote, Ji is a very sensitive girl. When her little sister was picked on by another SLEP student, Ji Zhao was crying and let us know what happened during the morning. She wouldn't let anyone push her around. She enjoys playing hopscotch at recess. She loves candy. She's tiny for her age. She dresses well. I picture her wearing sneakers. I never saw her wear slippers. She'd wear a dress or a t-shirt and long pants. End quote. While Ji was adjusting nicely to school and the ways of her new home, her family also began finding their footing. Di Chang picked up work as a kitchen helper while Li Yan was brought on to work as an on-call maid for a Waikiki area hotel. They weren't exactly pulling in a ton of money, but it was enough to cover their small apartment as well as clothes and food. Due to the erratic nature of their schedules, the children had to help around the house quite a bit, but Ji Zhao was always willing to do whatever she could to make the struggle easier. Li Yan explained, saying, quote, That girl is a very good girl. If she sees that the clothes are piled up, she'd gather up the clothes and do the laundry. You wouldn't have to tell her to do these things. End quote. Ji's older sister was more social, going out with friends and spending less time at the house, but Ji liked to be there. She took pride in helping out and saw it as her responsibility to do what was necessary. Li Yan says Ji was conscientious and gave her little trouble, explaining to the Star Bulletin, saying, quote, If I ever had to worry about my girls, I never thought I'd lose this one. End quote. Sadly, that's exactly what happened one quiet winter afternoon in February of 1988, when Ji was just 12 years old. 
Each year, Royal Elementary School would hold a fundraiser selling tickets for a chili sale. Students would sell the tickets in order to hit a goal of $150 each, which would afford them the ability to participate in a field trip to the Big Island. According to teacher Sherry Kim, Xi was not initially interested in participating in the event until she learned that her classmate and close friend, Hui Jun Lu, was planning on going on the trip. This seemingly caused Xi to want to go along too, and so she began participating in the ticket sales. In just her first two or three days, Xi showed tremendous progress, selling $40 worth of tickets, which were priced at $2.25 apiece. Royal Elementary had an explicit policy in place regarding any fundraising events. Students had to be instructed about safety techniques and given tips on where to sell and where not to. According to Sherry Kim, they told students to make sure they had a partner with them when they went out to sell their tickets, whether it was a friend or relative. In addition, teachers instructed them to try selling to relatives and neighbors predominantly and advised against trying to sell to strangers. Xi had followed those instructions, but apparently it hit a dead end as she'd run out of people she knew to try and sell the tickets to. So the 12-year-old decided that she had to find other opportunities for new sales. The morning of Thursday, February 11th, 1988, began as many others had. Xi awoke in the morning and sat down for a quick breakfast before getting ready to head off to school. Arriving around her normal time, everything seemed to be going well, and she was excited, as she always was, to see her friends and teachers. As far as has ever been revealed by investigators, Xi's day at school went off without a hitch. When the bell finally rang at 2.15, the 12-year-old was eagerly anticipating a few hours after school to try and sell more tickets. According to Li Yan, Xi arrived home at her normal time, having come straight home from school, which was located less than a half a mile away, resulting in a 15-minute walk for the 12-year-old. According to Li Yan, upon arriving home, Xi immediately began asking permission to go out and sell some more chili tickets. Li Yan was opposed to the idea, not wanting Xi to go out on her own, but the child was persistent, continuing to beg her mother. Leon later explained the moment when she agreed, telling the Honolulu advertiser that Xi promised, quote, Just let me go for one hour. This is my last day to sell the tickets. I have to sell the tickets. Tomorrow, I'll turn in the tickets I can't sell. I won't go far. I'll only be gone for one hour. This is my last chance to sell the tickets. End quote. Leon explained that before she allowed her daughter to leave the house, she made her agree to several conditions. Firstly, she was instructed not to enter anyone's car or home regardless of whether or not she was invited. Secondly, she was told to be very careful and to avoid anyone who seemed strange or made her feel uncomfortable. Finally, she had to be home by 5 p.m. for dinner. In order to ensure her mother that she would be back in time, the 12-year-old borrowed a watch from her sister and confirmed that she'd be back by 5. While we don't have an exact timeline to work off of, there are certain moments throughout the day that investigators managed to pin down. According to detectives, Xi left her family's Kailu Street home at approximately 3.30 p.m. Before leaving, Xi's mother gave her a few dollars, which the child tucked into a small coin purse she wore around her neck. Her first confirmed stop was at the home of a neighbor just down the road. One of Xi's friends lived nearby, and so the 12-year-old stopped over and knocked on the door, asking if her friend could come along with her to sell tickets. Unfortunately, Xi's friend wasn't able to go at that moment, and as a result, the 12-year-old pressed on alone. Kailu Street runs north, away from the Pali Highway, to where it intersects with Nuuanu Avenue. Along this stretch of road are many businesses, strip malls, gas stations, and convenience stores. There are two 7-Elevens spaced out by no more than three-tenths of a mile. To the northeast, there's the 7-Eleven at the intersection of Nuuanu Avenue and North Kuakini Street. To the southwest was the second store, located at the intersection of Nuuanu Avenue and North School Street. Detectives later revealed that the walk from one store to the other took approximately three minutes, and based upon witness statements, it appeared that G had been walking back and forth between the two stores, asking customers as they stepped out of their cars if they wanted to buy a ticket. Just 90 minutes after she left the family home at 5 p.m., she was supposed to return. When she didn't, her family didn't immediately break down with panic. 
Initially, they figured she might have lost track of time or was on her way home but running late. When 6 p.m. hit and there was still no sign of Xi, her parents decided to go out and look for her. Following the same route the 12-year-old would likely have used, they arrived on Nu'uanu Avenue and began going from business to business, asking if anyone had seen their daughter. Unfortunately, with neither parent speaking English, it was difficult for them to get across the urgency in their request. After walking up and down the avenue and not having any luck tracking down Ji or anyone who had seen her, Li Yan and Di Chang returned home and decided they had no other option but to call the police and report their daughter missing. The call came into the Honolulu Police Dispatch at 8.45 p.m., approximately five hours after Li Yan had last seen her daughter. Assuming that the child was lost or still lingering in the area selling tickets, the police figured it wouldn't take them very long to try and track her down. Unfortunately, they had no way of knowing that the child's mysterious disappearance would not be solved so easily. The first night's search failed to yield any results, and as more time ticked by, investigators began considering the possibility that there may have been some kind of foul play involved. Now, instead of searching for a missing child, they had the vastly more challenging task of trying to locate what was seeming more and more likely to be the victim of an abduction. Quickly, officials reached out to the media and issued alerts about the missing 12-year-old. Xi's photo was broadcast on television and published in local newspapers along with a physical description. At the time, the police couldn't be certain of what Xi was wearing the last time she was seen due to an issue with interpreting what her parents were trying to tell them. Flyers were produced using a recent image of Xi, and they were posted all over town, in local businesses, on telephone poles, trees, fences, and everywhere in between. The flyers described Xi as being 4 feet 11 inches tall, weighing approximately 70 pounds, and stated that she had brown eyes, black hair, and a fair complexion. Though investigators were still trying to determine where Xi had gone after leaving her family home, they did manage to find a series of witnesses who recalled seeing the 12-year-old. As a result of multiple interviews, detectives added to the flyers that Xi was last seen at the 7-Eleven convenience store in the Northeast, at the Kuakini Street intersection. During these first days of the investigation into Xi's abduction, while law enforcement were trying to find any clues they could grasp onto, the Lee family were struggling to accept the harsh reality. Neighbors and friends came over each day, bringing food and supplies to try and ease some of the family's burden. Li Yan was heartbroken, but believed her daughter would be located and brought home safely. It's difficult to imagine what must have been going on in her mind, as they had come to America just two years earlier, hoping to provide a better life for their children, and now their daughter was gone, and they were nearly alone in a strange new country. In hopes of establishing some kind of a timeline and perhaps a direction to look, the Honolulu police began a large canvassing operation which first focused in on the Lee's neighbors. One neighbor who had previously purchased tickets from Xi explained to police that shortly after 3.30, she'd spotted the child approaching cars driving down the road trying to sell tickets to them. Another neighbor told the advertiser that Xi had attempted to sell him a ticket, but he'd already bought one earlier in the week. From there, it seemed, Xi left her street and made her way towards one of the two 7-Elevens. According to Li Yan, Xi knew her limits, and when she left the house, she never went any further away than School Street. A clerk working at the Kuakini Street store believed he saw Xi that afternoon. He explained to the advertiser, quote, I can't remember whether it was Wednesday or Thursday, but she was here by herself. She picked up a nacho and tried to give me a chili ticket. I don't know if she was trying to pay for the nacho with the ticket, but I told her I couldn't take it. Then she left. End quote. While the clerk saw a lot of different people every day, he remembered G telling police that she often came by with her older sister in the afternoons to pick up a can of soda and sometimes some candy. According to the clerk, his interaction with G occurred around 4 p.m., which at this point in the investigation was now the latest time they had a confirmed sighting of the 12-year-old. In an attempt to track Xi down, investigators brought in tracking dogs who were given a sample of the child's scent before being brought out to search along Nu'uanu Avenue. Unfortunately, the dogs seemingly never managed to pick up on Xi's scent and were unable to track her. While canvassing had turned up the 7-Eleven clerk, it had yielded few other results. 
Essentially, investigators managed to confirm what they'd suspected, that Xi had been at 7-Eleven, but it didn't give them anywhere new to go. Asked about the possibility that Xi may have been a runaway rather than having been abducted, Sergeant Arthur Ledward told the advertiser, quote, I'm not saying there is foul play. I'm saying we suspect foul play, end quote. As news of Xi's disappearance spread across the island, the Honolulu police began receiving calls from all around Oahu. People everywhere claimed to have sighted the child in the days and hours after her disappearance, leaving investigators to sort through countless leads, many of which were ultimately dead ends. As a result, the Honolulu police sent out an island-wide alert, and patrol officers whose beats were in the general area of Xi Zhao's disappearance were put on high alert to keep their eyes open for the child or anything suspicious that might be connected to her. By the morning of Monday, February 15th, Xi had been missing for nearly four days, and a weekend worth of searching and canvassing hadn't turned up a great deal of information, although some new witnesses were discovered. Their statements now adjusted the timeline, moving the last confirmed sighting of Xi from 4 p.m. to 4.45, though it still placed her at the same 7-Eleven. According to Sergeant Ledward, all of the sightings after 4 p.m. were of Xi outside trying to sell tickets to customers in the parking lot. He explained, quote, We have a lot of information to check out, but none that we've already looked at has given us anything firm to go on. She still was last seen outside the store, end quote. Wednesday, February 17th, marked the celebration of Chinese New Year, but for the Lee family, there would be no happiness or excitement. While concerned friends and neighbors came by to try and support the family, they found them in a dark state, and little could be done to shake them free of the grief that was overwhelming them. Speaking to the Star Bulletin, Li Yan explained, quote, there is no new year for us. There is no joy in my heart. Only if she comes home, only then will my heart be at peace. She didn't even have a meal before she left that afternoon. She isn't a reckless type or naughty girl. If you told her a certain time to be home, she'd be home. End quote. This same day, the Honolulu police once again appealed to the public for assistance. They noted that since the initial report of Xi's disappearance, more than 30 officers had been involved in search efforts, though they were struggling to pick up any solid leads. While they were leaning heavily towards a belief that this was indeed a case involving foul play, detectives noted that they hadn't yet spoken to any witnesses who had seen Xi in any suspicious or dangerous situations. While witnesses had been helpful, they'd also managed to create a state of confusion, making the investigation all the more difficult. While some witnesses placed Xi at the Kuakini Street 7-Eleven around 4.45 p.m., others placed her at the North School Street store at the same time. Sergeant Ledward would later explain, saying, quote, We can't be sure where she was last. End quote. On Thursday, February 18th, one week after Xi had last been seen, the police decided to organize a series of roadblocks along Nu'uanu Avenue near each of the 7-Elevens, as well as on Kailu Street, where Xi lived. More than 40 police officers were involved in these roadblocks, at which they spoke to drivers and showed them photos of Xi, asking whether or not they recalled seeing the child a week earlier or in the days since. They got onto buses that stopped in the area and questioned drivers and passengers. They hung around the 7-Elevens and questioned customers and teenagers hanging out. They were also able to expand their description of the child, as an interpreter working with the family explained that, when last seen, Xi had been wearing white shorts with three hearts on them, a beige or light yellow t-shirt with a single long stem flower on it, and blue slippers. Sergeant Roy Urakawa explained the roadblocks, telling the advertiser, quote, We're hoping somebody might have seen something. Just hoping. This happened in the daytime, so I feel somebody must have seen something. End quote. Additional canvassing was going on at the same time, with detectives going door to door all around the area. While this didn't result in a great deal of new information, they did manage to track down at least one person who claimed to have seen Xi on her own street near her home at approximately 5 p.m. This witness, however, claimed to have seen Xi speaking to an unknown man, and while police believe this could be a positive lead, 
They needed more time to develop a composite sketch before they could announce to the public exactly who they were looking for. On Saturday, February 20th, investigators finally issued a description of someone they were looking to question. According to Lieutenant Gary Diaz, Xi had been seen speaking with an unknown man outside of the School Street 7-Eleven between 4.30 and 4.45 p.m. The man, who had also been seen in the same area by another witness earlier in the day, had been represented by two composites, based on interviews with different witnesses. The man was described as being white, six feet tall and slender, with a high forehead and long, dirty blonde hair brushed back from his face. His appearance was described as neat, with witnesses putting him in a blue-green plaid shirt and tan pants. Lieutenant Diaz made it clear that while they wanted to speak to this man, they had no evidence to suggest he was involved in any crime. Lieutenant Diaz explained, quote, We aren't accusing him of anything. We're not calling him a suspect. We just want to talk to him. We're not saying he's the last person who saw her. In fact, we have sightings of her from 3.30 to 5.15 p.m., end quote. Following the release of the sketches, the police were flooded with more than 50 calls attempting to identify the man or give locations where he had been seen. Several callers placed the unknown man in the Waikiki area, saying that he's often seen hanging around the beach. In hopes of drumming up more participation from the public, two rewards were organized for information leading to Xi's safe return. Zippy's Restaurant, who created the chili for the fundraiser, and Southland Corporation, who operated the 7-Elevens, combined to offer $2,500. The Chinese Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii and the United States Chinese Society also started a fund and were, at the time, offering $20,000. Asked about progress on the investigation, Lieutenant Diaz told the media that they were still in search of solid leads and were working to track down all of the calls they'd received. For the coming days... Diaz announced they would once again be canvassing the neighborhood. In the meantime, a private search effort was being executed. Run by the Hawaii State Emergency Unit, a nonprofit search and rescue squad, volunteer searchers were focusing in on areas which had been reported as potential hotspots by two so called psychics. No traces of Xi were found, unfortunately. On Monday, February 22nd, the Honolulu police issued new information to the public this time searching for the driver of a very specific car. According to Lieutenant Diaz, witnesses called in a reported sighting of Xi, which took place on Valentine's Day, three days after she had disappeared. According to the witnesses, they saw a young girl who closely resembles Xi sitting in the back seat of a car at a Sunset Beach area service station, approximately 40 miles north of Honolulu and on the opposite coast of Oahu. The witnesses described the vehicle as being a 1954 to 1957 Chevy, yellow in color. They described the car as having multiple primer spots on it, specifically on the hood, driver's door, and rear quarter panel. The vehicle had chrome rims and a swan-like hood ornament. The car did not have the classic Chevy fin-tailed back, but was square-backed. Reportedly, Xi had been seen in the car at approximately 3.30 p.m. while the driver was filling the gas tank. The driver was described as a dark-skinned man in his 30s, with his hair pulled back into a ponytail which had been dyed orange or orangey blonde. Lieutenant Diaz noted that they were going to be running computer checks for the vehicle and would begin running down the owners of similar vehicles in hopes of finding the man described by witnesses. Diaz, along with 15 other officers, had already canvassed the area and asked people about the vehicle, but no one knew the driver nor seemed to be familiar with the car. Or if they were, they couldn't offer up much information other than having seen the car in the past. Diaz noted that 10 officers from the missing persons unit were still working the case, and they had still received 10 to 15 calls per day on their tip line. In the days following the release of this information, more than 60 people called in in an attempt to identify the driver of the Chevy. Lieutenant Diaz told the advertiser that, for the moment, they were prioritizing callers over the computer printout, explaining, quote, Computers will just give us a list of license numbers for the four years. That's quite a few cars. And we could spend a good deal of time on each one just to locate a car and then meet with its owner to see if he fits our description. 
If we don't get anything right away from the public, we'll be going to this computer this week, but as a last resort. Remember, this car's driver is not wanted as a suspect. We just want to talk with him. There can't be but one, maybe two of those Chevrolets here with the yellow paint and primer in the right place. All we need is someone who saw it and knew its color was yellow with gray spots on Valentine's Day to call us today. End quote. Christina Valdez, secretary for the Royal Hawaiian Classic Chevy Club, stated that she had spoken with police, though no one in the club seemed to recognize the description of the Chevy that had been given. In addition to this, she explained that while the DMV printout listed approximately 425 vehicles registered that fit that description, there were likely well over 200 more on the island which were not registered. Being that no one recognized the car or a description of the driver, Valdez speculated that the man was likely a loner and not someone who was associated with their club. While the hunt for the Chevy and its owner was a top priority, Lieutenant Diaz wanted to make it clear that this was not their only lead, telling reporters, quote, we're still asking for information about that Caucasian man whose sketch was released last week, end quote. In March, three weeks after Xi's disappearance, the Honolulu police received a bizarre and disturbing call. At 10 p.m., a man dialed the 911 operator and relayed a grim story. According to the caller, who the operator described as sounding frightened, another man he was spending time with admitted to him that he had killed Xi. The caller abruptly ended the call, saying that the man was coming back and for police to call him the next day. Not wanting to wait, Lieutenant Diaz and several officers went to the man's home and questioned him about the call. In the end, it added up to little more than a drunken call from someone who'd made up a disturbing story. If that wasn't bad enough, it was but one prank of many, with Diaz telling the advertiser, quote, I can't begin to tell you how many of these calls we've had. Let me tell you, that was not the worst. End quote. According to Diaz, they were receiving between 60 and 70 tips a day for the first weeks of the investigation, but that number was beginning to drop off. They chased down every lead they had, and while some took only hours, others took days, and in the end, didn't bring them any closer to finding out what had happened to Xi. Asked about their investigation into the yellow Chevy, Diaz explained that of the 425 cars on the list given to them by the DMV, they'd already checked 325. At this point, Diaz noted, investigators were beginning to question the veracity of the reporting, explaining, quote, the public's focus has been on the yellow car. We have lots of people seeing her at the 7-Eleven store on Kuakini Street on the day she disappeared, but there was not one sighting of that car. We can either get more information from the driver or we can eliminate it as a possibility. It's like all the tips we get. You don't know until you check it out. We have to look into them no matter how time-consuming and frustrating it is. You can't ignore it. You never know. Maybe tomorrow, we get a tip that solves the mystery for us. End quote. Unfortunately, the investigation began growing stagnant, and the Honolulu police acknowledged that as tips were drying up, so were directions to take the case. The number of officers assigned was reduced, little by little, as other crimes required immediate attention. As law enforcement slowly pulled back from searches, a private group began organizing large and expansive search efforts focused on covering every square inch of the island. The group, led by retired military policeman Frank Lee and Honolulu attorney Wilson M. N. Liu, drew in thousands of volunteers. Frank Lee organized the searches to begin close to where Xi was last seen and then to slowly span outward, going to the most isolated valleys and streams in search of the child. Among those who volunteered was Susan Suzuki, the sister of Diane Suzuki, a 19-year-old University of Hawaii student who had mysteriously vanished three years earlier in 1985. Oahu was carved up into 21 designated areas for volunteers to search. Frank Lee gave extensive instructions on what to do should anything be found, to trust their instincts, and how to not disturb potential evidence. Locals were joined by off-duty military members, ROTC students, off-duty firemen, and others who wanted to help give their time to try and track down the missing 12-year-old. 
Multiple searches were held over the next few months, with thousands involved. These searches covered a large area of Oahu, though in the end, they never found anything that could bring them any closer to Xi or the person responsible for her disappearance. Despite setback after setback, they were unwilling to give up, with Lee telling the advertiser, quote, We'll keep on going. Until we find that girl, how can we give up? End quote. By the end of April, more than two and a half months had passed and still there were no new leads, developments, and the men sought by police remained unidentified. Wilson Liu, the lawyer who had helped organize searches, revealed to the media that they'd found a witness who claimed to have seen Xi being pulled through the 7-Eleven by her arm by another boy, believed to be around her age. This boy allegedly introduced Xi as his sister, though the 12-year-old did not have any brothers. While they were excited about this lead, Lieutenant Diaz was less enthusiastic, reporting that they'd heard the same report, but their investigation had determined there was little to it. This alleged sighting occurred at approximately 10 a.m. on the day of Xi's disappearance, and school records confirmed that Xi was at school all day, meaning she could not have been at the 7-Eleven that early. Lou also reported that they were searching for an older Asian man allegedly seen talking to Xi around 5 p.m. on the day of her disappearance. For his part, Lieutenant Diaz noted that they hadn't had any witnesses telling them anything like that, and as such, they had no additional information about who the man may have been, where the conversation might have taken place, or if indeed it was Xi that was seen at all. Sadly, this is where the search for Xi begins to drop off more rapidly. Throughout the spring and summer of 1988, details regarding her case slipped from the headlines, and while her case continued to be worked, it doesn't appear as though a daily hunt was occurring anymore. In November, nine long months after Xi's disappearance, it seemed that all avenues had been exhausted. Investigators noted that they hadn't had a new lead in a long time, and they hadn't been able to track down either of the men they wished to question, nor the yellow Chevy that witnesses claimed to have seen Xi in. During his time running search efforts for the girl, Frank Lee told reporters that he'd received a few different tips, suggesting that the 12-year-old may have been abducted by someone with ties to sex trafficking. As for the Honolulu police, by the end of 1988, while Xi's case was still classified as an endangered missing person, the majority of investigators believed that the child had likely been the victim of a homicide. There, the case truly began growing cold, and soon, days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. In August of 1994, Frank Lee was continuing his search for Xi. Older and in worse shape and struggling with medical issues, Lee was still determined as ever to find the missing child. Asked about his involvement, Lee explained, quote, It's something I can't forget. I told my wife I can truly see a light at the end of the tunnel. If I get well, I'll start all over. What got me was these people didn't know this society. They were lost, and they needed help. Shame on me if I don't share my knowledge. End quote. Attorney Wilson Liu had not yet given up either, and both men acknowledged that they had been in communication with and working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMEC. In hopes of revitalizing the case, NICMEC was developing a new, age-progressed photograph to show what Xi would look like six years later, when she would have been 19 years old. Eight months later, in April of 1995, Nick Meck finally completed the age progression and was ready to distribute the new updated image of Xi. However, this would not be a mere flyer campaign. Instead, Nick Meck teamed up with Advo Incorporated, a direct mail-based company in Connecticut who have an extensive address book. Advo had been issuing advertisements for their products, which also showed the images of missing persons. On Monday, April 10th, what would have been Xi's 20th birthday, became the launch day for this new program. More than 57 million households across the country would receive the advertisement with Xi's photos, both the original and the age progressed, along with a detailed description and information regarding her disappearance. Ann Clarkin, a coordinator working with Nick Meck, 
explained that after the first mailings went out, they began receiving calls from all across the country. Any calls with vital information were immediately directed to the Honolulu police so they could conduct follow-ups and try to track down potential leads. According to investigators, they received approximately 30 leads with potential. Officer Joseph Self was optimistic, telling the Star Bulletin, quote, It's been seven years. Someone may have come up with a good lead. Who knows? We just have to work with whatever we get. End quote. Unfortunately, like so many other tips, investigators would find themselves no closer to the truth, and G's case by the summer of 1995 began growing cold again. Three years later, in January of 1998, the Star Bulletin sat down for an interview with Li Yan just one month before February would mark 10 years that Xi had been missing. While as time passed, the perspective on the case grew darker, with many investigators believing that Xi had likely been killed, Li Yan refused to accept this, saying that until her daughter was found, alive or dead, they had no way of knowing what had happened to her. Things had become more difficult for the Lee family over the previous decade. Stress, pain, and grief about the loss of their daughter made it hard to maintain a job, to get heavily involved in family events, and to move on. At one point, the couple were moved out of their small garage apartment, and while they appreciated the effort, which had placed them into a more proper home, Leon didn't want to lose out on the possibility of Xi calling home one day so she's maintained the same phone number since 1988. Leon was continuing to work hard to support her family, though medical issues had sidelined her husband. Unfortunately, the family had little they could cling to to remind them of their daughter. Leon kept a Valentine's Day card she had given her in the days before her disappearance, and only one photo which remains, the rest having been given to the media and never returned. Two years later, in January of 2000, Leon finally achieved one of her dreams by obtaining American citizenship. For years, she had tried to become a citizen but found herself unable to focus, overwhelmed by stress and pain. Asked about this development, Leon gave a thumbs up saying that she was thrilled to have seen her dream come true, but that her most powerful wish continues to remain her desperate hope that someday, somehow, she will see her daughter again. Eight years later, in February of 2008, it had officially been 20 years since Xi mysteriously vanished from the streets of Honolulu. In an effort once again to revitalize the case, Nick Mech issued another age-progressed photo showing what Xi would look like at the age of 32. Using photos of Xi's parents and siblings spread out over the years, they hoped to develop what her appearance would most closely resemble after 20 years. While Lee Yan said they hadn't been in contact with police for quite some time, Ron Jones, Nick Mech's senior case manager, explained that they maintained contact with investigators on a monthly basis, but there had been no recent developments. Ten years later, in May of 2018, former Lieutenant Gary Diaz sat down for an interview with KHON News about several cases he'd been involved in. The most prominent and most difficult case for Diaz was Xi's abduction. Asked his thoughts about the disappearance, Diaz replied, quote, Well, I'm among a group of people who believe that she met with foul play. Now that being said, I would pray that I'm wrong, that nothing happened to her, and somehow, somewhere, she's alive, and somewhere, somehow, she will come forward if she is alive. You kind of always say, did I do enough? Did we do enough? and we felt at the time of the incident, we did the best we could to try and locate her. End quote. While Diaz felt they had done everything they could to try and track down Xi and the person responsible for her disappearance, there was one person, one lead, that he could never pin down that continues to haunt him to this day. In the early 2000s, Diaz released a book about his experiences working as a cop in Honolulu. The book, entitled... Honolulu Homicide, Murder and Mayhem in Paradise, digs into many cases the former investigator worked. Xi's case is one that Diaz goes into in great detail, and it's there that he revealed for the first time a lead that's always stuck out in his mind. According to Diaz, a beat cop directed him to a local man who had gotten himself into trouble on several occasions, 
for harassing young women as they walked down the street. The man, later diagnosed with schizophrenia, talked and behaved in an odd manner. He often would refer to himself in the third person, saying he did this or he did that, when really he was talking about himself. At one point, when asked about Xi, the man told Lieutenant Diaz that, quote, he took her up to Nuuanu Stream, end quote. This caused Diaz to launch a massive search of the stream, which involved tracking dogs, cadaver dogs, the SWAT team, and countless others who offered to search every inch. Unfortunately, they never found anything to bring them closer to Xi. According to Lieutenant Diaz, they questioned the man multiple times, but they couldn't get a great deal of information out of him. In an effort to push him, Diaz told the man they no longer needed his help and wouldn't be talking to him anymore while they hoped this would cause the man to give them additional information to keep their attention. Instead, it resulted in the man coming to Lieutenant Diaz's home with a gun to threaten him. Ultimately, the man was arrested and given mental health care, but he never revealed what, if anything, he truly knew about the disappearance of Ji Zhao Li. Ji Zhao Li was last seen between 4.30 and 5 p.m. in the vicinity of the 7-Eleven at the intersection of Nuuanu Avenue and North Kuakini Street on Thursday, February 11th, 1988. At the time of her disappearance, Ji was described as being an Asian female with black hair and brown eyes, standing 4 feet 11 inches tall and weighing approximately 70 pounds. Ji's teeth were slightly crooked at the time, and her eye teeth were only partially grown in. Ji was born in China, but lived in Honolulu from 1985 until her disappearance. She was still learning the English language, though she could understand more of it than she could speak. Ji was last seen wearing white shorts with three hearts on them, a beige or light yellow t-shirt with a single long stem flower on it, and blue slippers. G was 12 years old at the time of her disappearance, and if alive today, she would have turned 47 years old this past April. In 1985, the Lee family's dreams came true. They were finally able to escape the oppression and control of the Chinese government, coming to America in search of a better life for them and their children. Sadly, within two years of arriving in their new country, the Lee family would suffer the painful and haunting loss of their daughter, Ji Zhao. Now, more than 30 years later, they continue to hope that someday they'll learn the truth. Asked if she believes her daughter might still be out there somewhere, Li Yan replied, quote, I still think about her every day. I'm still hoping she can return because they can't find her body and there is no proof she is dead. When I see these pictures, my heart aches. The disappearance of Ji Zhao Li is one of those cases where it's overwhelmingly frustrating because it seems like almost anything is possible. A 12-year-old girl leaves home and heads out to sell tickets for a school fundraiser, something that happens in this country almost every day. This time, though, the child didn't make it home, and in the more than 30 years since she was reported missing, the truth of what became of her and who was responsible has remained elusive. In some cases, you can become easily frustrated because of the utter lack of evidence. In others, it seems impossible that a case hasn't been solved because there is so much evidence. Ji Zhao's case is a blending of the two. Investigators have a fairly good idea of what happened. They just don't have what they need to figure out where to go next. When you look over what we know for certain, it doesn't exactly add up to much. The two 7-Elevens that Ji Zhao was walking back and forth between the day she went missing were just a block north of where she lived. The two stores were spaced out along Nuuanu Avenue with just three-tenths of a mile between them. According to multiple witnesses, Ji Zhao would hang out at one spot, approach customers as they drove into the parking lot to try and sell them tickets, and periodically she'd walk down to the other store to continue the process. This, of course, created a lot of confusion because investigators were getting statements from witnesses that placed Ji Zhao at both locations at the same times. A clerk working at the Kuakini Street store told police that he specifically remembers Ji coming in by herself. Strangely, for as many people actually saw Ji that afternoon, no one seems to have seen where she went after 7-Eleven. Depending on which tips you follow, they take you in different directions. 
The first account police received, which made them believe they were on to something, came when several witnesses reported seeing Xi speaking to an unknown white male between 4.30 and 4.45 p.m. Reportedly, this interaction occurred outside of the Kuakini store, and depending on which witness you rely on, the two seemed to be speaking for anywhere between 5 and 10 minutes. While several people saw this interaction, no one actually saw what happened after. While it's entirely possible that the man went on with his day and thought nothing of it, it's also possible that he convinced Xi to come along with him. No one reported screams of any kind or a struggle, so whether or not Xi did go with this man remains unknown. To this day, the composite sketches are available, but investigators never managed to track down and identify the person witnesses described. Sadly, a white guy with long, dirty blonde hair wearing a blue-green flannel and tan pants isn't exactly the kind of description that really makes someone stand out from the crowd. Next up is the tip regarding the little girl being seen in the back seat of an older model Chevy. This account is fascinating for two reasons. It's highly detailed, at least regarding descriptions of the vehicle, and at the same time, there's nothing to support it. Police were contacted by a group of friends who were in the Sunset Beach area on Valentine's Day, February 14th, three days after Xi had last been seen. According to them, they saw a child fitting Xi's description sitting in the back of a 1954 to 1957 Chevy. The car was yellow in color, had chrome rims and a swan-like hood ornament. The witnesses stated that the Chevy needed work as there were gray primer spots on the hood, driver's door, and rear quarter panel. The driver himself was described as a dark-skinned man in his 30s, with his hair in a ponytail that was dyed orange or orange-blonde. While all this sounds very intriguing, there's a couple of details that police found confusing. How is it that the witnesses got such a good look at the car, but such a fleeting glance at the girl in the back seat and the driver? According to investigators, it sounded like the person reporting this tip was very familiar with cars and was able to describe details that the average person might have missed, but at the same time, while they could give a super detailed description of the vehicle, they never saw the license plate, what direction the car was going to or coming from, any interactions between the driver and the child. Now sure, this all could have happened relatively fast, but investigators were hesitant to rely too heavily on these witness accounts. It wasn't just because of what the witnesses said, but more so because of what other witnesses didn't say. While plenty of people had seen Xi that afternoon, on her own street going door to door, walking along New Uanu Avenue, stopping at each of the 7-Elevens, not one person had reported any vehicle in the area that matched the yellow Chevy, nor did anyone give a description of someone interacting with Xi that even remotely resembled the driver witnesses described. According to detectives, while they found people who claimed to have seen that car around the area, they never managed to track down anyone who actually knew the driver or could point them in a new direction. It's strange that so many people remember Xi, but no one could remember this car. Of course, there's always the chance that the car wasn't actually there that day. Either this yellow Chevy and the driver weren't involved in any way, and it was all a matter of mistaken identity, or, I think it's worth considering, that just because someone may have had custody of Xi in the Sunset Beach area that Valentine's Day does not mean they were directly involved in the abduction. Now, don't get me wrong, if Xi was in the car, I don't consider the driver innocent by any means, but he may have been the next link in the chain. Perhaps someone abducted Xi and sold her to this man, or maybe this guy is involved in trafficking children and was transporting her to another location. Honestly, with as little information as we've got, it's hard to know for sure. So, if you turn away from the white guy with the long blonde hair or the driver of the yellow Chevy, that really only leaves you with one other option. Lieutenant Diaz's person of interest. We don't know a lot about the guy Diaz described, but just based on the things the man allegedly said, it's not hard to consider him a viable person of interest. When asked about Xi, he had several replies, sometimes saying she had been taken down to the new Uwanu stream, other times saying he knew where she was or where she was being kept. Unfortunately, the more the man was questioned, the less reliable his responses seemed to become. Factor in that he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia, and you have to ask yourself, does he actually know something about Xi's disappearance, or are his responses a result of his mental health issues? I think it's worth noting that Lieutenant Diaz stated that the man was brought to his attention by a patrolman. 
According to Diaz, this unidentified man had gotten into trouble before for harassing young women as they walked down the street. Unfortunately, no additional information is given, so I don't know if this is describing the guy yelling out to women and harassing them, or if things were getting physical and threatening. I think it also stands out that it would be really nice to know their definition of a young woman. Was he harassing women over 18, or was he primarily targeting children that were closer to G's age? Suffice it to say, I don't think investigators would have spent a ton of time on this guy interviewing him trying to get to the bottom of it if they thought he was making it up or was completely off base. They spent a lot of time talking to him and even launched a massive search of the new Uwanu stream because of the things he said. The problem is we just don't know what's reliable and what isn't. He could 100% believe that he saw Xi or saw what happened to her or was directly involved in what happened and he could still be wrong. I tend to fall into the camp with this case where I think it's possible this guy knew something, saw something, or was told something about Xi's disappearance, but I don't think there's any solid way to get that information out of him. He later went on into treatment and was medicated for his schizophrenia. I find it hard to believe detectives wouldn't have returned to interview him again after he was treated, but it's also entirely possible that when they did speak to him again, he had no recollection of anything related to Xi Zhao. I think this is one of those cases where we all know what likely happened. A 12-year-old girl out selling raffle tickets mysteriously disappears. Extensive searches of the island turn up nothing over months and months. Not a trace of Xi is found. No shred of clothing. No strand of hair. Nothing. This leads many to believe that foul play had to have been involved, with Xi either being abducted and kept by someone in the area, abducted and trafficked to another location, or perhaps abducted and killed. Now, while I have a rather jaded and pessimistic view of this world, this is an instance where I can't just rule it out completely that Xi could still be alive. Someone could have abducted her with intentions of raising her as their own. Someone else may have abducted her and sold her into some kind of human trafficking. While the smart money seems to be on the theory that Xi was abducted and likely killed within days, there's always the chance that she's still out there somewhere. Maybe she doesn't know who she used to be. Maybe she was raised by a family that convinced her they were her family. Or perhaps she's been through so many traumatic situations that she has no way of remembering her life before she was taken. Regardless, I think it's important to keep her story alive. And with Nick Meck continuing to age progress her photographs, maybe there's a chance that someday we'll know what happened. 34 years ago, 12-year-old Ji Zhao Li mysteriously vanished while selling tickets for a school fundraiser. For nearly four decades, her family have wondered what became of her, where she was taken, and whether or not she is still alive. They maintain their hope that someday Ji will make her way back home and they'll finally be reunited. While investigators remain grim, believing that Ji was likely killed, they can't prove it. And until that day... Her mother will never accept that Xi is not alive out there in the world somewhere trying to make her way home. Sadly, without new information, someone coming forward, or the discovery of new evidence, the disappearance of Xi Zhao Li will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Xi Zhao Li, there are many newspaper articles, forum posts, and news specials covering her case. The most helpful articles for this story came from the Honolulu Star Bulletin and the Honolulu Advertiser. If you have any information about the disappearance of Xi Zhao Li, please contact the Honolulu Police Department at 808 529 3111. Her case number is B49038. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, 
Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levinen, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. This completes our look into the mysterious disappearance of Ji Zhao Li. Next week, I'm planning to release a Q&A episode in celebration of our upcoming 200th episode. So if you've got a question you'd like to ask about a case, the show, me, or anything in between, send it over to traceevidencepod at gmail.com or tag me with your question on social media. I'm looking forward to answering anything you want to know. So once again, thank you again for listening, and I hope you'll listen next week to a special listener Q&A.